Well, as far as my recollection is concerned, uh, my remembering began in Ankara, so that must be, I must have been around five years old. And my grandmother sold all our properties because we were known as one of the rich families among the Armenians because my grandfather owned seven acres of grapevines and there was hundreds of workers working them and they they predicted that the Megarian family was one of the richest families in Ankara. So then my grandmother decided that we would get out of Ankara and try to find some of our king folk, king folks. Some were living in, in Konya. So my uncles were living in Konya, my aunts were living in Konya. So we came to Konya in a covered wagon through the desert because there was no other transportation except the covered wagons. My mother was fortunate enough when my father was alive before he was killed uh, to have two girls and me. We were three of us in the family. And I was, uh, being the boy, my father thought that uh, the whole world belonged to him because I was the only boy and he made parties every night for 40 days. That was one of the customs when a boy was born after a girl. So, and my mother was very good and she was more wealthier than the Megarians. Her name was Alboyan. The Alboyan family, which was known in those places all over, that they were very, very wealthy people. And my father, after he graduated, he became a merchant, silk merchant. He had a store in Ankara and also a store in Konya. So that was, I think, my grandmother's ambition was that to go and get the store settled in, in Konya. And that's how we happened to go to Konya. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, uh, as a little boy, as all little boys do, play marble on the street. I remember. I remember this Turkish uh, man walking down one of the, uh, you call them one of the government officials, I guess, ordering all the Armenians out of Konya in five days. So my mother, my grandmother, I run down and call my mother and grandmother out and for them to hear it, that all the Christians have to get out of Konya in five days or else they will be massacred or sent into the death camps or in the deserts to starve to death. So my grandmother knew a Turkish officer there. Apparently my grandmother used to help his wife used to be very ill, and my grandmother used to go every day, give her a bath and things like that. So he never forgot the favor. So he said, don't worry, Hanum. He says, I'll look after your family. Tonight at midnight, I send my soldiers and they'll take all your plongings and bring it to my house. And your children and you and your daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law will stay in my house. So my grandmother decided that we would go to Greece. And Greece is a fairly large place, but the town where we went was a seaport named Corfu. The, the Greek ocean liner was a mile away from the seaport, and we had to go through the immigration and uh, look through all our clothes and everything else that we're not smuggling money 
out of Turkey. So my grandmother, which I said uh, she was quite smart, she was a businesswoman, and she had a lot of money, and she turned all the paper money into gold money. And one night I waked up through the night, and I see that she was making a hole in an orange and grapefruits and lemons and sticking in a gold piece and then put it in the bottom of the basket and then put regular oranges on top of it. So when the immigration officer asked her, what is all this fruit for? So she said, I got three children and they, if they get sick on the boat, we need to have lemons and oranges and this and that. So the officer was kind enough to not examine any more she, she let it go through. That's how we saved a lot of money. She saved her money. And in the end, she says, if we lose the basket or anything should be stolen from us, she had a $50 uh, dollar gold piece. She swallowed it. So in case anything should happen, when we get to Greece, we'll have money to buy bread. Well, my mother was sick all the way coming, took 10 days from Mersin to Corfu in the bottom of the boat where all the refugees were there. And when we arrived, we took a, a big boat to come ashore. And when we came ashore, they marched us down about a mile, mile and a half to our uh, camp. After we arrived, as far as I remember, uh, typhoid fever had set in among the refugee in the refugee camp. And the Greek government was kind enough to send fumigating machines to fumigate. And 90% of the women and the boys, they had to cut all their hairs off. So the lice and the, and the disease that there was uh, they claim that came through the hair and they should be washed every day their hair and I remember my mother got so sick that they had to take her to the hospital one morning I was playing with the boys and I saw four or five well-dressed men and a couple of ladies they were looking around in the refugee camp and my grandmother, through a translation, found out this people from the Lord Mayor's Fund orphanage. And they were looking for young boys to send them to Canada. They had a big orphanage, but there was thousands of boys, but that ain't what they were interested in. They wanted younger boys seven, eight, nine-year-old boys to send to Canada to become citizens of Canada. Originally, this is what their intentions were. And uh, when uh, we finally came to Georgetown, Dr. Vining said to us that uh, we were going to grow up as a Canadians and he also changed our names and he expected one day we would be member of parliament in, in Canada. There was no such a thing as farm work or anything like that. And he said that we were going to stay in Georgetown and there is to be open a school and we were going to get a fair good education and then we were going to go out in the world our own with few dollars provided by the home. My mother cried day and night that I was the only boy going to be shipped away. And uh, her health was poor anyway. So she fought with my grandmother that you're not going to send this boy away. But my grandmother went to an Armenian doctor there and said, uh, where is this place called Canada? 
the Lord Mayor's Fund wants to take my boy to the orphanage, my grandson to the orphanage. So shall I let him go or not? So the doctor said to my grandmother, it will be the wisest thing and that you let your son go to the Lord Mayor's Fund and if he's going to Canada, his life, it will be sad. And if you live long enough, you will see his earnings one day. So my grandmother was convinced, convinced and she came back and told my mother that no matter what you say, the boy is going to go to the orphanage because if he stays in Greece, go to school and everything else, he will be taken in the army in 20 years. You're going to lose him anyway. So this way, if he goes to Canada, his life will be saved. And that's how my mother was persuaded and she let it go. She let me go to Canada. So during that time, the, the, the missionaries, they came and took me away with eight other boys from the, from the camp. And they took us to a camp where to bring our health situation up a little bit better. I think we were there six weeks, eight weeks in the camp. And then we came back to the orphanage and they measured us up with suits and things like that. And one day came that uh, we, had, we were going to Canada. But at the same time, the Lord Mayor's Fund gave me permission to go and see my mother every second week to go to the refugee camp with a guardian and bring me back to the camp again. And they were, my mother and my sisters were also allowed to come to the camp every other week to visit me. And I used to save my food that Sundays was the day that they used to come. And I used to save my food for them. So as in the old country, they had bread round like a bagel, big round bagel. They used to cut it in four pieces and they used to give you that and a big hunk of havla, which is uh, some kind of a sweet made with uh, tahini and stuff like that. And I used to save that inside of my shirt and uh, I used to give it to my mother so they can have something different to eat. So this is the way we passed. I think we were there about at least three months. And then the day came where we had to part. And of course, my mother, grandmother, was notified to see us at the seashore where the Knot line was waiting for us and uh, a mile away from the shore to take us with the small sailboats up to the big boat. And that's when my mother broke down. And I can remember, just like yesterday, she called me back. And I just about jumped out of the boat to swim. And during the camp, while we were there, they taught us how to swim also. So I was able to be swim, and the boys held me back. And finally, after tearing and everything else, and my sisters running up and down the shore, waving a white handkerchief, saying goodbye to me. On that trip, we were 50 boys. The first bunch of boys that they came to Georgetown was 50 boys. And also in Sherbrooke, we were examined again for our health. And a couple of the boys had trachoma in their eyes. They were held back. 
but they came back afterwards, a few weeks later. After their eyes were cured, they sent them back. So after 10 days in the Atlantic crossing, we came to, Sher uh, we came to Quebec City. And that's where we on board the ship. And uh, Dr. Vining met us at, uh, at Quebec City and marched us to the train and we came to Montreal. And in Georgetown, after three days after we came to Georgetown, they did find an Armenian that lived in Hamilton. He was a former teacher in Egypt and he could fluently English and he used to translate everything what Dr. Weining said and what he did for three years, four years. We arrived, we arrived in 1923, July the 1st, to Georgetown Farm. That was the day we arrived, right at Georgetown Farm, July the 1st, 1923. When we arrived in Georgetown, our dormitory was not ready yet. We were provided with blankets and we, it, was, it was in July, so we slept outside for three days. And the way we were explained, uh, Mr. Alyanakyan, which our Armenian teacher told us that we were going to travel for months and months and months. So the boy says, this ain't where we're going to stay. And uh, they decided that they're going to walk back to to Montreal. So there was an electric car running from Georgetown to Western Ontario, Western. And they start running away. At this time, we had an English teacher, Dr. Dr. Edwards, his name was. His name was Dr. Edwards. And him and all the farmers gathered catching the boys all the crossroads that, that, that they came. There was about 15, 20 of them. They took their heads and went, start going on the, on the railroad track to find themselves back to go to Corfu again. That's how much, that's how young they were and that's how mentally they weren't thinking that they could never walk all that way and cross the ocean. But anyway, the boys were captured and brought back. I wasn't one of them, I was one of the good boys, but I was a bad boy later. No Armenian translator till three days later. So we were, uh, we were disturbed, we were hungry. Uh, we did find out later that there were 700 apple trees on that farm and 500 cherry trees. So we start eating apples and uh, in the morning they used to give us oatmeal and we never saw oatmeal in our life and people used to say this is something dirty we can't eat this you know it looked like uh, they used to say looks like number two you know they won't eat it so they used to go and pick apples and eat apples and a lot of them used to get diarrhea and we didn't know but then a few days later they brought a nurse her name is miss farmer and they brought a cook, so she stopped us eating apples. And the dining room was ready. They used to serve us potatoes and, and uh, things like that. And a few months later, they brought an Armenian cook also. She used to cook on Sundays Armenian pilaf. And, uh, and we used to eat that. And while we were settled in Georgetown, a lot of Armenians used to come and visit us. Mostly Mr. Babian, Mrs. Babian, Mrs. Utichian, and Mrs. Mr. Utichian. They used to come and visit us and bring us candies, balloons, and things like that. So the boys used to get amusement from that. 
Oh, we were homesick. We were crying for our mothers. We were crying, crying every day. But uh, when the Armenian uh, Babian and all them started coming and told us that we we're going to be okay in here, we we're going to see that we will, won't forget our language and we were going to go to school, we we're going to be grown up to be good boys and things like that. We gradually uh, gave up the homesickness and started behaving like we were boys should behave. Especially our, when our Mr. Alexanian came, he gave us a lot of encouragement in our being, so we were gradually settled down. It took about a year, but we gradually settled. But I used to hear the boys cry in their beds, and I knew what it was. And you see one crying, the other one starts crying. And we went on like that, like that until we came from 10, 11 years old.